He is risen. 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 He has risen. He is 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 risen. He has risen. He is 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 risen. Wow. You guys are great. He is risen indeed. I want to say thank you for participating and adding so much to our Easter service. You really made my heart uh, joyful and happy just watching those things. A uh, little preparation. At the end of our service, at the end of the music, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So if you will, during some time, you need to go find some bread, crackers, uh, some sort of juice. You can use coffee, whatever you decide to use. As we take the Lord's Supper, we celebrate what Jesus Christ did for us, especially this Easter. It's going to be a great day. Let me pray us into this time of worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ into this world to live a perfect life so that he could be the sacrifice that gave us new life. Now, Lord, we love you. We love the time of Easter that we can celebrate his resurrection and the life he gave us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing. I need to risk my sins. 
burden was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end that I'm breathing. I have the future, my eyes are open, cause when you call me. verses 5 and 6. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Let's celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty and our Savior is risen. He lives.
Once again, Stonebridge, we are so excited to be able to gather together today for worship. We just wanna let you know that wherever you're watching and whoever you're watching with, we'd love it if you would take a picture and tag Stonebridge in it so we can repost it on social media. It's a fun way to connect with each other once again. And you know, if you chose doing the Easter outfit or Easter pajamas, either way, we can celebrate Easter as a family. We also wanna let you know that we have tons of ways to continue to connect here at the church. If you visit ghoststonebridge.com slash stay connected, there's ways in every single ministry to stay connected here. We have men and women talking about the Bible every week. We have the students playing games through Zoom. Uh, we have so many ways for your kids to get connected through the lessons, as well as they posted a resurrection egg hunt today. So definitely go online and check that out. We also wanna let you know that we have pastors and staff online right now, ready to connect with you. So visit ghoststonebridge.com and click on the Go SB Live button and on Facebook Live. And we'd love to check in with you as well as offer an, an answer prayer request. So that's it for the announcements, but we wanna jump back into worship. As I was reading in the, the different accounts, the four gospels all have the story of that first Easter Sunday. Um, and the thing that I was paying attention to um, this time was that just looking at the different emotions uh, that people brought to the tomb that day. Um, I can only imagine after having been through what they went through on that Friday, the silence of Saturday, um, they brought disappointments, they brought brokenness, they brought fears. But what's amazing that day when they left the tomb is they were changed. And the only thing that makes sense is that they encountered the risen Christ. And you know, on this is a, this is a really, really different, it's a weird Easter. It's not, we don't have the traditions we're used to. There's a lot of disappointments we're feeling. There's a lot of sorrow that we're feeling right now maybe for different reasons. Maybe anxiety, fears. But what's the same today as it was then is that when we encounter the risen Christ, we are changed. And what's amazing is that as powerful as our despair might be at times, as powerful as our sadness might feel, our disappointment might feel, what Easter reminds me of is that the hope that Christ gives is greater. The peace that he brings is greater. The courage he brings is greater. And that's what's so beautiful. It's not just some historical event that was isolated in time 2,000 years ago. It was an event that forever changed history and still matters just as much today. So as we continue to worship, my desire for all of us is that we would still today encounter the risen Christ. Let's sing it. on the 
to the stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born. that first Easter there weren't very many people there but it was the most significant event in human history you just can't stop Easter and right now all over this planet uh, there may be empty church rooms like the one we have right here but also there is an empty tomb and that's the most important thing we can remember today uh, our homes are full but our hearts are, can also be full with the hope that Jesus Christ alone can bring and we're just so grateful here as a church for your continued generosity. Uh, and you have uh, continued to be faithful in your giving and allowed us to express uh, the, the heart of Christ to those that are in the greatest need. And so let's go to now to the Lord and thank Him for this opportunity to give. Our Father and our God, you are uh, the giver of every good gift. And you have continued to pour out blessings in our lives. And we are looking to you now more than ever before. Lord, not just for the, the physical needs we have, but Lord, emotionally and, and spiritually and, and mentally, we need uh, the, the peace that only Christ can bring in these days. And Lord, we offer these gifts to you, uh, not out of a sense of duty or obligation, but Lord, in a, a desire to express your generosity that you've given to each one of us, particularly this day uh, where we celebrate Easter. We pray you would use it and you would cause uh, many people to be blessed. We pray for those that are, that are sick, for those that are on the front lines, that are a part of the healing, and that all of us, as we, as we offer these gifts, we would do it for and through Jesus and for His glory. We pray, Lord, now for this time of receiving uh, the, the message of hope uh, that, that Steve brings from Your Word, and I pray it would have its desired effect and You would renew us our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus we pray amen Well, it's an unusual time uh, this Easter. I've never done it quite this way before. As uh, I was reading and as we've been talking about Easter, actually for months, it, it, it um, impressed me how there was such a change that was occurring, not just now with all the things that we're going through, but I guess that helped me recognize as I was looking back at the, at the shift, the change that was occurring 2,000 years ago uh, in the nation of Israel, and eventually this change how much of an impact it would make on the entire world. What you have to remember is that Israel for uh, centuries, for so long, had lived with the prophets, the law, um, all of those things that, that were a part of their natural 
a staple in their religion, the temple, the sacrifices. And uh, for, for so long, that had been the norm that when all of a sudden Jesus comes and changes things, it can be very difficult. In fact, it works for us that way today also. They're just ways that we live our lives and, and they're ways that we have figured it out that this is the way it's gonna happen and, and this is what makes me a good person or a valuable person. In fact, un, not unlike Israel, we have our laws and our rules to, to how we live and, and to what our standard is. And for most of us, uh, we try to stay true to that even though it's, it's difficult because it can be changing. It was the same way um, with them. Uh, most of us understand that there's a need for laws and rules. It's a good thing. If you're a parent, uh, you will make rules for your children because in doing that, you will tell them what you want them to do, what it means to grow up and be a, a good young man or a, a young lady. Um, you will set uh, rules and boundaries so that there are some guardrails that keep them out of trouble and, and keep them from wasting their time and their life because you want good things for them. You want a good life for them. And if you look in the uh, Old Testament, that's the way it was in the Old Testament. All these rules and all these laws were set to do this. But uh, as you and I look at it, there's still a problem. In fact, if, if you're honest about your life today, there's still a problem. With all the rules and the laws that we put into place, there's still something wrong going on inside of us. That those laws and those rules just don't fix. Uh, they don't make it they don't make it right. So this is that time in history, 2,000 years ago, when all the laws and the rules seem to clearly point to a change that is occurring. Uh, even though it's hard to accept that, it's hard to, to acknowledge that, but they were. And Jesus was that change. In fact, what we read in the scriptures is that uh, Jesus came, was born, uh, he lived for 30 years before he started his ministry, and Jesus never sinned. I mean, he continued to remain faithful and true to God and pure um, in, in, in a way that we could never do. And so something is, something is coming with Jesus. When the disciples began to follow him and they began to know him, they know he's different. Uh, just the things he taught, the things that he did, the miracles that, that he performed. There was something incredibly different about Jesus. And so they realized that he was their king. He was going to be their king. Last week we talked about how um, Jesus asked them, who do the people say that I am? And they gave natural answers that we would give. Most of them still uh, revolved around someone who would give laws and give rules and help instruct them. And then he asked them, well, who, does, uh, who do you say that I am? And that's when they replied, or Peter replied for them, we are the Messiah. But as we said last week, there are two questions still lingering. What does that mean? What kind of Messiah was Jesus going to be? What, what did that mean as far as he was the Messiah? Because I don't think they fully understood it, and it was pretty clear that Jesus didn't believe they fully understood it because he told them not to go out and talk about it. And then the second thing is, then what kind of followers, if, if, if he was the Messiah, if he was the rescuer, what did that mean about us, about our lives? And it would change how we would look at our lives. The disciples didn't fully understand that either. In fact, like us, they were still trying to prove themselves, still trying to do the right thing, still trying to, I guess for the guys, man up and be faithful and be true. And you see this uh, even later on, this is in Mark chapter number 14. So this is near the end of, uh, uh, of the gospel of Mark. This is more than likely, this is Peter's version of the story and Mark is the one who records it. And it says this, um, on the way, uh, Jesus told them, now this is, this is on the way uh, to Jerusalem and on the way to his final week um, where Jesus would be crucified. On the way, he told them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And here's Peter doing maybe what, what you would want to do, what, what the best of us would want to do. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times 
that you even knew me. No, Peter declared emphatically. Even if I have to die for you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. So you, you can see this, this determination that they have, that they are going to be true, that they're going to be the ones who change things in the world, that, that they will not fail him. But they would. In fact, as Jesus um, goes and he is captured by the uh, Pharisees and he's put on trial, and Jesus is mistreated, he is abused. Jesus takes on all of this shame, all of this scorn upon himself, and it, it, it takes away the heart of the disciples. Just like when you and I feel scorned or shamed or things are not working out in our life, that, that we feel the same way. It's, it's difficult for us to deal with this, this sense of humiliation, uh, this sense of disappointment that we have in life because things are just not working out the way we wanted them to. We recognize, if we're honest, deep down, this is pointing to something deep down inside of us that's not right. It's not the way it should be. There should be a bigger strength. Our response should not be hinged on the response of other people or the circumstances around us or what the current culture has decided is good or bad true, not true. There should be something bigger, stronger, deep inside of us. And I think that's what Peter was trying to grasp hold of. In fact, here's what we read, that Peter actually goes into the courtyard following after the soldiers and the Pharisees when they take Jesus and they put him on trial. So Peter, of all the disciples, is still determined, if all the other disciples fail, I'm going to be faithful. But as he goes into this courtyard and he's standing around the fire, he looks around, he realizes these people aren't with us. They're not with Jesus. In fact, even the soldiers that were in the courtyard are not just Roman soldiers. The Romans would, um, when they took over other regions, other lands around Israel, they would conscript men into being soldiers. In other words, uh, they were forced to be Roman soldiers. And these men hated the Judeans. So, so they were glad for these things to happen to the Judeans. It, it, it stripped Peter of his courage, so much so that there was a woman there. And she looks at Peter and she says, wait a minute, I know you. You're one of those Galileans that was following Jesus. I, I know exactly who you are. And, and Peter does exactly what he said he would never do. He denies that he even knows Jesus. Now, this, this sends Peter into a tailspin and all the other disciples. Because as Jesus is finally taken to the cross and Jesus is crucified, uh, we, we don't read that the disciples are there. In fact, they're hidden away. They believe that they are the ones who would be next. In fact, it's, it's such an Im impressive uh, part of the story to me. When, when Jesus on Sunday, two days later, it's on the third day when, when Jesus is raised from the dead, it, it's not the disciples that find him. It's not the disciples that are still hanging on and still believing and still determined to be faithful to Jesus no matter what. It, it's actually the ladies. Here's how um, it's recorded in the Gospel according to Luke. In verse uh, 1 of chapter 24, it says this, But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, and they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They, as they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back to the tomb to tell the, or back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples, because Judas wasn't with them anymore, and everyone else, what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But catch this, 
the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Yeah, because to them, they were still crushed. They were still living in this time where it's, it's all fallen away. Everything we'd hoped for was gone. We blew it. We didn't do our part. So how could anything good come from it? But it's actually the women who stay faithful and they continue, even in their disappointment, they didn't understand, but they're the ones that go and they're the ones that discover. And in their day, the, the, the word of the women would not have been trusted the way the word of a man would have been trusted, but they were right. He wasn't there anymore. He wasn't a, a, a part of the, the dying and the death of life. Jesus was alive. He'd risen from the grave. That, that's Easter. In fact, it is so significant because if it's not, if, if Easter is not true, if Jesus Christ doesn't walk out of the grave and walk into life, then all of the things that he said that he was doing, that he would accomplish on the cross, those things would not be true. He would not have conquered death. He would not have conquered sin for us. But the point is, he did. And, and it wasn't their faithfulness that conquered these things. It was Jesus who conquered these things for us. The whole system changed. Now it was not how good could you be? Uh, how, how, would you be how would your goodness be measured? Is it better than other people? There's no grading on a curve. Um, there's no sense of you have earned your place. Instead, Jesus would offer something that we could never win or gain or achieve ourselves. And for them, it came through a most unlikely voice and un most unlikely witnesses. Later, there's another guy named Paul. And uh, Paul is on the other side during all this. He's one of the Pharisees. He's one of the leaders of the opposition group who wants Jesus to die, who wants to eliminate him to prove that they are right and that their way wins. And then Peter, I mean, then Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And, and his life is totally changed when he realizes that Jesus Christ is the one who won. They didn't win when they crucified him. They didn't get rid of him. In fact, they only opened the door for Jesus to do what he came to do, and that is set people free. So Paul's life totally changes. And years afterwards, many years afterwards, here's what Paul writes to the Romans. He says, dear brothers and sisters, he says, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved, because these are his people. He says, I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it was misdirected zeal. In other words, their enthusiasm didn't make it right. No more than my enthusiasm for my way or, or proving that somehow I'm good enough or that my truth is the greatest truth, it, that it would make that right. And he, he says this in verse 3. He says, for they don't understand God's way of make, making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way by getting right with God, by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believed in him are made right with God. And then he says down in verse number eight of the same chapter, in fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and it is in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love what he says, especially when he says that everyone who believes in him, who trusts in him, will not be disgraced. If you go back and you look once again at Peter's life, as Peter tried to fix it himself, as he tried to prove he was good enough, Peter's inevitable end is a disgrace upon his life because he couldn't do it, but not so with Jesus. Jesus goes to the very end, 
not deterred, fully intending to finish the mission that he was called to. In fact, when they interrogated him, when they put him on trial, they would ask him all sorts of questions, and Jesus would not answer the questions until they asked him this one question, are you the Messiah? And he says, I am. In fact, they blow up over that one. They say, that's it, we've got him. You know, he's claiming to be God, and that's exactly what he was claiming. And then when he's taken before Pontius Pilate, he doesn't answer Pilate's questions either. Same reason, because Jesus is determined to finish this mission. Even though he's not guilty, even though he's done nothing wrong, Jesus continues to take on the scorn, the shame, the humiliation that was due us, because we're the ones that fail all the time, but he was willing to take it all on so that he could set us free. And Jesus only answers one question with Pilate also, and Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? He says, I am. And Jesus goes to the cross as a lamb that is led to slaughter, the Bible says. A lamb that is a innocent sacrifice being given on behalf of the people. And that's who Jesus was. But Jesus walked out of the grave to prove that his sacrifice really did take away our sins. It really did cleanse us. We really are made brand new. It's not that we don't sin anymore. It's not that we don't feel guilty at times. It's not that we don't fall into the trap of thinking we've got to be good enough and we've got to be determined enough and we've got to prove ourselves. That's a very human thing to do. But Jesus became our rescue. I love this last verse too. Uh, Paul writing to the Corinthians much later um, he's giving them part of an attitude toward life that, that he has now because of what Jesus uh, has done. And this is what he says. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. He says, that is why we never give up. I love that. That is why we never give up. He's not talking about himself. He's not talking about because of what we do or humanity does. He says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, he's acknowledging it. Listen, this, this is a temporary world and temporary life, and it's okay because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. It will because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus Christ did for us. So I want to ask you to do something during this time. I know that there are some people here that, that you are, are believers, you are followers, and this is a time of, of questioning and this is a time of struggle and what God is taking, what is He taking us through? What does He want us to learn? Uh, this is a great time to renew your trust, uh, to deepen your faith, to decide to spend more time reading in the scriptures themselves and seeing who Jesus was and all the things that we could learn about him. A time to go to him in prayer, not only taking your troubles and your struggles, but going to God and, and being grateful to him and thankful to him that, that he has become your strength, that he has become the one that, that gives you the strength and the power not to give up. Even when you fail, you get back up and you go again because of who Jesus is. But also if you're here and you've never put your hope and your trust in Jesus, maybe this is something you realize that you need. And maybe today is the day that you face the fact that you can never fix it yourself. No matter how much you try, no matter, no matter how much you put into your efforts, that your way is not going to fix it. But God's way will. Jesus rising from the grave proves that He is the one who can give you life, something that you could never give yourself. Your life is temporary. Mine is also. Um, the events of this world will keep happening. Troubles will keep coming and eventually, physically, they will overtake us. But even though they seem to overtake Jesus, they didn't win. Jesus conquered both death and sin so that he could give us life. So I want to encourage you. It's, it's a risk. It's a struggle. Does it mean your life will change if you trust Him and you put your hope in Him? Of course it will. Your, your whole life shifts. Uh, in the Bible, it's actually called repentance. It doesn't mean that you fix your life or you clean up your life. Repentance means you, you change the way you see it. You don't see it the same way anymore. And then because you don't see it the same way anymore, Jesus is actually the one 
that, that brings more cleanliness to your life, that brings more fixes to your life, all pointing toward the day when Jesus will fix it totally, fix everything, all the problems, all the struggles. There'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, all the things that we want to go away, uh, Jesus will cause those things to be made right. But today is the day that you can put your hope and your trust in Him so that He becomes your confidence, so your faith is sound and secure, so that you can understand what real love is, the kind of love that Jesus taught His disciples, He can teach you also. So will you pray with me? And if you've never opened up your heart, never surrendered your way to His way, would you do that? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you gave your life for me. And you, you did it at great expense, at great pain. You did something that I could never do. You, may, you remain true, faithful to your task to the very end, all because I realized for the first time, all because you love me. You cared so much for me that rather than to pursue your own interests, your own desires, you followed the desires of your Father so that you would be the sacrifice that could set us all free if we would just believe. We put our hope and our trust in you. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Forgive me my sins. Place a new spirit in me, your spirit. Teach me how to live differently and fill me with hope, Lord, in, the, in this time when people need hope. Show me what it means to really love other people the way you want to love them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, hopefully you've, you've gathered uh, some, uh, some things for the Lord's Supper. I think I have them in here. I brought them with me. This is uh, Lord's Supper from McDonald's, um, McGriddle. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different than maybe what the uh, early believers uh, celebrated with, with the unleavened bread. And, uh, but I will tell you that this grape juice, and it is grape juice, but it's been in the refrigerator a long time. It, it might have a little bit of a kick to it or some sourness to it because it's, it's not quite that uh, fresh. Aged in a plastic jug. And, uh, and I want to celebrate with you. Remember what Jesus Christ did for us. And so I want to read for you. Here's what uh, Peter records through the Gospel of Mark uh, that he remembers very short about that time, the last Lord's Supper with Jesus, because it was the last one he would take, and the next time Jesus said he takes it will be the day that the kingdom uh, comes. So in his last time with them, this is what he said. This is in Mark chapter 14, if you want to turn there with me. It says this in verse 22. As they were eating, they were celebrating the Passover, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And then in the next verse it says, And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Dear Lord, thank you that we can still remember, that we can still benefit from the life that you lived, the sacrifice that you made, and we can still find life in your resurrection, the proof that all that you promised, all of it, would come true for us. So, Lord, we thank you for your love for Jesus, for those around us who can celebrate with us. And, Lord, we also thank you that you've placed us and left us in a world that still needs to hear, still needs to see Jesus living in the life of other people. Lord, use us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's uh, sing again as our worship our leaders come back. Let's celebrate all that Jesus did for us.
His body on the cross and blood poured out for us the way of every curse upon Him. Mm-hmm. One final breath He gave as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. Oh
Hey, I can't tell you what this time together has meant to me. Uh, just knowing that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, He gave us a brand new life, just changes everything, even in the circumstances that we are in today. So we're so glad that you celebrated with us. We, we're so glad that you could join with us in a heart of worship. And we look forward to the day coming that we will gather again together. See you on that day.